All right, just to make sure <laughs> there are three people here. I see Chad, Sally, Jaren, and Twisson not here. Okay, we're going to first look at how Maxwell's equations predict electromagnetic waves. This will not be on today's exam. It would be game for the next exam. It covers the material that would have been for this exam, but since we haven't covered it until today, I'm not going to put it on today's exam. So let's look at it. First, Maxwell's equations. We've already seen these. We have these four equations. And I've shown them in both the integral form and the differential form. Since you've already seen them, I don't think that there's a lot of need to dwell on them other than to point out just the basics of we're going to use today the differential forms. Most of your work is all but one of your problems, I think, has been done with the integral form. And so how do you move between one and the other? If you look at these, what do you notice about the right side of Gauss's law? What's the difference between the two? Okay, one of them has the integral of dv and the other doesn't. Well, of course, what you do to one side, you have to do to the other side. It's kind of a rule. And so if you take the del dot e, what is this del? What does that mean? It's a directional derivative. So it's a spatial derivative. It's like a first derivative in position. Well, then we have, this is an integral with dA for the integral form. Well, if we go from first derivative with position and we take a triple integral, it's the same as getting rid of the first derivative and doing a double integral. So we can see some relation from going from here to here in terms of just the units. We essentially did a triple integral on the first derivative to get a double integral. There's still some vector work to be thought through because this is e dot dA and this was derivative dotted with e. But you can see that there is some reason to expect that there is a mapping between those. The del dot e is proportional to the charge and um, charge density. Del dot b is, strictly speaking, going to be proportional to the magnetic charge density. But by definition, what is the magnetic charge density? Zero. Hence, that one's always zero. If I'm in a vacuum, then there's going to be no... Uh, okay, I'm just going to erase that. There is going to be... We'll see it again on the next slide. There's going to be no charge distributed in a vacuum, so the del dot E is going to be zero if I'm in a vacuum as well, because there's no charge distributed there. Now we get down to Faraday's law and Ampere's law. Faraday's law and Ampere's law, <laughs> more confusing here, del cross E to E dot DL. But once again, you notice on the right-hand side, integral of this vector dotted to DA, on the right hand side, that's how you go from one to the other. And so that means we're doing a, a double integral in space, and that was a, the del is a first derivative. So a double integral of a first derivative is going to give you a single integral. So it's easy to see why, unit wise at the very least, it holds together. Once again, there are some directional things to be worked through, you know, with the cross product versus the dot product but you can see some relationship. Important things about these two that we've already established is that Faraday's law says a changing magnetic field will create an electric field. And Ampere's law says a changing electric field will create a magnetic field. So now let's go to how we derive how we derive Maxwell's equations. So I have four steps here. We're going to go through these four steps. Step number one is you take the curl. Curl is the name we give to taking del cross, the gradient crossed with your property. 
for both sides of the differential form of Faraday's law. What so, is that? I've been wondering ever since we've... What is what? Del cross, like, like, like physically... Like well, remember, del is just... Of that direction vector. So when you do a cross product, and you may not have seen the full-on way to do a cross product. Unfortunately, I have on this slide, <laughs> everything on this slide is already taken up below. But I'm going to just go to the previous slide and put it at the bottom of the previous slide. So rewriting Dell. So if I do, if that's del, and that it was del cross e, right? Or well, let let me just. What one of our laws was del cross e? So I'm just going to do e. E is equal to i hat e x plus j hat e y plus k hat e z. There I've written the two vectors in components. If I do del cross E, we actually find it by doing a determinant. I hat, J hat, K hat, and then the I component of the first item in the cross product. So in this case, that would be D, D, X. The J component of the first one, D, D, Y. The K component of the first one, D, D, Z. And then my I component of the second one, EX, J component, EY, K component, EZ. And so then, to do this, I have to evaluate that determinant. So using the first line, the, the first row, as the row that I'm going to, you guys know how to do a determinant, no? Okay. Do, doing a determinant, wow, this was not the goal of today's lecture. Doing the determinant, you choose any row or column. And so I'm going to choose this row. And you take the first item, and so this is going to be the first item i hat multiply it by the determinant of its co matrix the co matrix is the matrix i get when i take out the row and column of that first item so the co matrix for i is this matrix here and so i have Now, the next step is the trickiest part, I think, of the whole process. I have to flip the sign for the next one. So it's going to be minus instead of plus. J hat. And, of course, the co-matrix for J hat, I have to take out the row and column J is in. And so I have this and this are the two for the J hat. And then finally, the last one, switch the sign again, so back to plus k hat, and the determinant of its co-matrix And then I finally do my last, <laughs> and doing the last one, it actually is where you see it is important that when you're doing determinant you do them in the right order. Doing the last evaluation then, this comes out to be equals I hat times DEZ DY minus DEY DZ.
minus j hat d dz dx minus d dx dz and my final one plus k hat d y And so that is doing the full cross product with del. <laughs> now, if I had vector v cross vector b, I still do the cross product mathematically the same way. We've been doing simplified forms in everything we've done. We've just been using two dimensions for everything. And so we didn't have to go through this three-dimensional form. But this is the three-dimensional form of doing a cross product. And I had derivatives in there, which shows you you have to do this acting on this minus this acting on that. Right? You guys learned probably in high school. I certainly did in high school how to do that. Okay. <laughs> Anne's laughing because, well, Anne's still a high school student. So she certainly has learned it in high school, right? Because now still counts. So why is the J minus? Why is the J minus? I don't remember the theoretical reason. I always just say, because the Levi-Civita symbol says it is. What's the what? The Levi-Civita. <laughs> or Levi-Civita is what I learned to say before I was corrected. Different pronunciation for the same letters. L E V I. C E V I T A. Yeah, I, 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 I learned to call it, in high school, we learned to call it the Levi Savita, and then in college I was taught, no, it's Levi Savita. So this is an actual thing, you actually make the word. That is correct, sir. <laughs> I am not making stuff up here. What is the Levi Savita? It, it's, it's a permutation index, okay. and it changes signs when you switch to indices. And so you make one switch, it goes from positive to negative. You make a second switch, it goes back to positive. That's what it is. It's, it's a linear algebra thing. If you've taken linear algebra, you learn about it. If you haven't, you haven't. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, we, we learned about it in high school, but different people have different high school teachers. OK, so that's, that's what the cross product, that's how it plays out. So back to this, doing the actual derivation. I haven't gotten through all the steps yet. I just had the first one. We're going to do the curl of both sides of Faraday's law. And then we're going to use the vector identity. I don't expect anyone to know this vector identity offhand. That del cross parentheses del cross E is equal to del acting on del dot E minus del dot del. Del dot del is just written as del squared. It's a second derivative. Right, if you go through, well, you do the dot product, it's going to be ddx acting on ddx, which is second derivative with respect to x squared. ddy acting on ddy. So it just comes out to be a second derivative. So we're going to do that for the left side. And then we'll substitute, I'll do steps three and four together. Substitute Gauss's law for a vacuum and substitute Ampere's law for a vacuum. And then that should lead us to the end. So let's go through and do the math. Hooray? Your excitement is not nearly as overwhelming as mine is with this. So step one, take the curl of Faraday's law. So I'm going to do del cross this here is equal to minus del cross that. So okay. 
there I've done del cross to both sides. Simple enough, right? Now I'm going to use this vector identity and I'm going to rearrange the right side of this equation. So for the vector identity, the left side of the equation will become And remember, del dot del, what I say that's equal to? Del squared. del squared. For the right hand side, del is a spatial derivative. DDT is a time derivative. It doesn't matter if I do my time derivative first or if I do my spatial derivative first. I just have to do both derivatives. Right? The order of doing the derivatives doesn't matter. And so I am going to switch the order. So I'm going to put minus d dt of del cross b. I'm going to actually, because I can, I'm going to move this down just a little because I wrote it a little too high and it's crashing into things. <laughs> Except for I missed the bottom part of the D. Okay, so there I've rearranged the right-hand side and made the substitution for an identity on the left-hand side. The identity, you can look it up, you can go through and do the simplification if you like. <laughs> right, you do this cross product and then do this cross product on that result. We've already done this one, so we're halfway there. And you find out that it comes out to be the same as that. It's an identity. I don't feel the need to go ahead and prove it. So the next step, I'm combining two steps in one. I'm substituting Gauss's law and Ampere's law. Why substitute those two? Well, Gauss's law, I will substitute here. Well, let me actually not circle that one. I will substitute here for Gauss's law. But if I'm in a vacuum, how much charge do I have in a vacuum? Zero. So this is going to be equal to zero in a vacuum. So I'm going to put a zero right there. That does make life easier, doesn't it? Zeros always simplify things. And then if I look at Ampere's law, I have... On the right hand of this, del cross B, and so I'm going to replace it with this del cross B from Ampere's law. But if I'm in a vacuum, how much current density do I have? Zero. zero. And so this term here is going to be zero. Actually, I should have done it that way for the other one as well. And so making those substitutions... I end up with 0 minus del squared e vector is equal to minus d dt of mu odd epsilon naught de dt. Notice there's a minus sign on both sides. So I just multiply both sides by minus 1 and get rid of that. And mu and epsilon, those are constants, so I can move the derivative through that. And I will have a second derivative, so this just becomes del squared e vector equals mu ot epsilon ot d second e vector dt squared. That's my result. Now you look at that, and I expect that most of you say, I don't think he's actually shown me anything. Is there somebody who disagrees with that? So we're all good with this, that you don't, haven't learned anything useful yet. But to James Kirk Maxwell, he did, because he knew, and we stayed this first semester, that the wave equation 
is that equation shown in black. If I have some function for displacement that has the second spatial derivative is equal to 1 over the speed squared times the second time derivative, then that function describes a wave. And so looking at these, I am definitely going to take away the rectangle part. Hi, Sally. If we look at these, this here is a second spatial derivative. That's just a three-dimensional version of d second dx squared. Right, it's d second dx squared plus d second dy squared plus d second dz squared. It's a three-dimensional version of it. And of course, the right-hand side is a second derivative with time. And so by matching these up, those two things, oh, nice circle. Those things have to equal each other. So from this, James Clerk Maxwell determined that the speed of an electromagnetic wave must be equal to 1 divided by the square root of mu ot epsilon ot. And so he had, by combining these four Maxwell's equations, well, actually, how many of them did we really combine? Three of them. By combining three of Maxwell's four equations, he saw that this predicted that you could make an electromagnetic wave. Now, that's pretty, pretty robust, the prediction that electromagnetic waves exist. And it gave a speed for the electromagnetic waves, so that also, it's a, it's a very rigorous derivation. Now, a rigorous derivation doesn't mean it's going to occur in nature because, well, your starting points may have been incorrect or your logic somewhere. But as far as anyone could tell, and it has been shown out through experimentation subsequent to this, because you come up with a theory, you've got to test it, that indeed we make electromagnetic waves, and indeed they have this speed. And that speed turned out to be the same as the speed of light, and then he made the serendipitous conclusion that light must be an electromagnetic wave because they had the same speed. And it was Heinrich Hertz who actually did experiments that showed that electromagnetic waves did the same types of things, the refraction, the diffraction, um, interference patterns that you can make, as light did. And that's what actually convinced people that they were the same. In and of themselves, those aren't really perfect either, but at this point, we can measure electric fields and magnetic fields for light waves, and so, yeah, now we can be real, real confident. Okay, any questions about that derivation? So, the del squared is essentially saying a second derivative? It's the second spatial derivative, yeah. Spatial derivative means it's an x, y, and z. Right? Quite literally, del squared. I, where, didn't I write that down somewhere? Maybe I just said it. I'll go back here. Because it's a dot product, you just take the x component with the x component, the y component with the y component. I'm just trying to reconcile how d squared, d squared f of x, y over dx squared is the same thing as del squared e. Well, it's... It's just three-dimensional, right? If you, if you look what I did here, we have d second dx squared mm -hmm. plus d second dy squared plus d second dz squared. It, it has the derivative in all three spatial directions. The equation that I showed here, whoops, I went one too far. The equation I showed here for the wave equation was simply the one-dimensional wave equation. So it only had d second dx squared 
It didn't have the other two because I was just showing one dimensional. What we found was a three dimensional equation with Maxwell's equations. So the three dimensional form of this is del squared instead of sec d second dx squared. But because when we say first semester, all we saw was d second dx squared, right? We didn't do waves on a, a sheet, which would have had two dimensions. We did waves on a string, which just had one dimension. And so I want to put the same form that we saw first semester. Other questions? So, yeah. This is just by way of showing us what he did to come up with the wave. Like, this is going to be on the test. This would not be on the test that is today. It would be on the next test after this. And that's because I can't expect you to just have feed it in in the morning and have it internalized and ready to go in the afternoon. I think that would be overly demanding. Okay. Then let us look at some review for the exam. So there are only three options that you're going to have for your calculus portion of the exam. You will either have a question about, and I do have it all ready made, so it's not like there's going to be a change here based on who asked me questions. A question on Ampere's law, the Biot-Savart law, or Faraday's law of induction. So let's briefly look at those three laws, because you know that you're going to have that one question that's on one of those three. So the integral form of Ampere's law, it's not going to be the differential form. It's going to be the integral form if it's Ampere's law. And of course, Ampere's law, right? because we are Americans, and none of us, except for Toussaint, can actually pronounce it without you know, feeling guilty if not doing it incorrectly. So we have this equation, the circulation integral b dot dl. That's calculated over what loop? It says loop, but over what loop? Imaginary. An imaginary loop, that's right. It's not in a, a loop that exists necessarily anywhere. It's an imaginary loop for calculation. And then we have mu watt, second integral of j dot dA. The equation sheet just shows integral of j dot dA means the same thing. Right, because if it's dA, it has to be a second integral. Equals mu watt I enclosed. In other words, I is equal to the integral of j dot dA. So that says that the magnetic field going around something depends on the current going through. Now, Maxwell added to that, so once again, we won't have Maxwell's addition. We'll just have this if it's going to be Ampere's law. When do you choose to use Ampere's law? And don't say never. Exploitable symmetry like infinite wires. Yes. We only had two exploitable symmetries that we used it on, and I'm only going to hold you to those two for Ampere's law. Either a wire of a very long wire, i.e. an infinitely long wire, or a solenoid. Those are the only two situations. What were the conditions that made it exploitable? Why are those two going to work for us? And basically nothing else. Maybe I should go back a step. What do we use this to find usually? We actually usually use it to find the magnetic field created by a current. We could go with something that's not quite as nice symmetry if they gave us the magnetic field everywhere and we could find the eye enclosed. So that we wouldn't need as much symmetry if we had the magnetic field everywhere and we're finding the eye enclosed. Right? We can do the calculation of B dot DL if we know what B is. So we're, we're usually using this to try to find what the magnetic field is. And so the two conditions that I gave you are specifically that finding the magnetic field due to current going through a wire, or current in a solenoid. And why just those two? Because for the wire, the wire has a cylindrical symmetry. So I can choose my path to be a circle going around the wire with a constant radius from the wire. And in that case, just based on the symmetry, the magnetic field has to be constant strength as I go all around my loop. So B is not going to fluctuate in strength. And furthermore, since the magnetic fields have to form closed loops, 
To maintain the circular symmetry, my magnet fields have to be circular loops. And so that means the B is going to be parallel to L all the way around the loop. So I have two conditions. B is constant, and B dot DL is just B times DL as I go around the loop because of the directions. Since B is constant, I can bring the B out of that integral. I just have B times the integral of DL over a circle. Nobody needs calculus to know that the integral of DL over circles, what we call the circumference of a circle, 2 pi r. And so the right or the left hand side just becomes b times 2 pi r if we're doing it for the wire. And then the right hand side, of course, just mu watt times the turn and close. And so you right away get the magnetic field strength. Wait, is it supposed to be b cross DL? No, it stopped. Didn't you just say that they were perpendicular at all places? Parallel at all places. Oh, right. Okay, never mind. That's what Sorry. you wire, right? I was thinking of um, the, the, the example that I'm explaining right here is for a very long straight wire. Yeah, that's when you can just um, multiply the times 2 pi r. Yes, and because you have those two conditions. The magnetic field strength has to be constant at a constant radius to match the symmetry. And the direction has to be going in a circle, so it has to be the same direction as the dl. So b dot dl turns out to be a constant b times dl. So you have to get that's all for b. But that would require the symmetry of a long straight wire. If it's not a long straight wire, you don't have that symmetry, you can't do that. The second case we did was the solenoid, where inside the solenoid, we had b is constant and parallel to dl. The sides of our little loop were perpendicular to the magnetic field. So B dot DL is zero because they're perpendicular on the sides. And then we go way out there, so at the end, B is zero at the end. And so B dot DL is zero on that. And once again, we had to have the right symmetry for those to be true. If you have a solenoid that's really short, well, it's going to fail. Right? It's got to be long. You find the magnetic field in the center of that long solenoid. So those are the two options for using um, Ampere's law that you might see, the solenoid or the wire. Then we have the Biot-Savar law. The Biot-Savar law, just like Ampere's law, is usually used to find the magnetic field. Now, in fact, usually used, as far as I know, it's only used to find the magnetic field. Right? The Ampere's law, you, if you knew the magnetic field, you could find the current enclosed. But with the Biot-Savar, all you can do is find the magnetic field. And so we have these two forms. I'll tell you, this is the form that's on the equation sheet on the test. Since the two are exactly identical, there's no reason to have two. So when do we use this one? And we're trying to find the magnetic field. So in this case, you have no exploitable symmetry. You need to identify the direction for ds cross r, the magnitude for ds cross r, and that's r hat. Magnitude for ds cross r hat is going to be ds times sine of the angle between ds and r hat. Question? Um, can you really quickly again explain how we use this term in the direction for ds? Right hand rule. Or, or wait, for DS, for DS, excuse me. I thought you said for DS cross R. My, my, my head went the wrong place. For DS, it would be the direction the current is going in any part of the wire. For using the Bio Savar law, you're integrating over the entire wire and find the magnetic field created by the current going through that wire. And so DS is going to be going along the wire. So unlike with Ampere's law, you don't have some imaginary loop that you made up. You're integrating over your wire. So you need to find the direction of the cross product, the magnitude of the cross product, break things into components if necessary, you know, based on the right-hand rule for your directions, and then integrate. So we did two examples of this, I think, in class. We did the circle, and we did a long infinite wire. So I actually showed you using two different methods to find the magnetic field for the long infinite wire. One was using... Ampere's law, that one was reasonably simple. 
One was using the BS of our law, not super hard, but definitely more complicated than using Ampere's law, which illustrates why you would choose to do the, the one with the simple geometry with Ampere's law. We also, with the circle, it was somewhat easier because we had some fixed angles. If you have a path that's not a circle, it might be more difficult. Um, you know, like if you had a path that was going like this, and you're finding the magnetic field created here, yeah, then you're going to be a little angry at me. But if you have a path that is just straight lines and circular arcs, well, that's not going to be so hard. You just say, okay, for this part, the current's going that way, so DS is going that way, and R is going always from the wire to the point I'm looking at. So there's my R vector. What direction is the magnetic field, because of that straight stretch of wire at the point that I, have, I will label in just a moment P. What direction is the magnetic field due to that? Coming out of the screen. Okay, we have coming out of the screen. Now, I actually haven't evaluated it yet, so I'm not saying yay or nay. You got that by using the right-hand rule of the cross product. We have ds cross r hat. So my ds is this direction, so my hand goes that way. Orient it so I can make my fingers bend in the direction of the r, and indeed, it comes out of the screen. And then you would have the angle between these two, and you would have ds cross r hat is equal to ds sine of that angle out of screen. And you'd have to do basically to equation for each portion of the wire that was going there. Well, I would go from one edge of the wire to the next edge of the wire. Um, I may have a wire that goes off to infinity, like we did with the long straight wire, or I may have some other thing, you know, like when we did the circular loop. Well, there was no infinity involved, you just did one loop around the circle. Yeah, you would do it from the beginning of the straight part to the end of the straight part, and then you'd do another one for the loop. Okay, thank you. Did you leave out the R? Um, well, this was R hat. Right. And so since it was R hat, R hat has a magnitude of 1. And so that's why it's just ds sine theta. Right, if I had done ds cross R vector, then that would have been R D S sine theta out of screen. Right, since that's a vector sign, I have the R. That's a hat, then I just put a one out front. One. Well, I didn't write the one because it's one. Okay, so we all good on the bio savant? <laughs> Hide and put the thumbs up. Okay, final one, Faraday's Law of Induction. Faraday's Law of Induction deals with the changing magnetic flux producing an EMF. And I, the EMFs look like that on the equation sheet. I tried my best to get a scripty, a, a blown up epsilon is the best I could get. Sorry about the not perfect EMF sign. So you need to be able to find the flux. Remember, how do you find the flux? Remember, by definition? It's the integral of b dot dA for our surface. So there is calculus in that flux part too. You can't forget that there's calculus there as well. You could have, you know, lots of interesting things. But that flux is the integral of b dot dA, and then we're taking the drift with respect to time. Taking the drift with respect to time is not going to get rid of the integral, right? Different variable. So you have an integral of b dot dA. And they take a derivative of that with respect to time. 
There are so many different permutations on that, you just have to be able to find integral v.da and be able to find the derivative of whatever you get. What's the minus sign there for? Yeah, direction. Mind you use Lenz's law. So when you have your coil, right, if your coils are going this direction versus this direction, it makes all the difference in the world. And so that's why I don't try to apply it to anything particular with the minus sign, just remind me, okay, let's look at Lenz's law and we can determine what it means. So those are the three calculus-specific types of questions you might have to go along with, of course, all the review that we did yesterday in class. Now you have 10 minutes in which you could either go get pizza or ask me questions. <laughs> Chad's already out the door. <laughs> There's a major pull between my mind and my stomach right now. Um, they don't actually have pizza. They don't actually have pizza. They don't actually have pizza. It's in the, the A troop, so. Can you show us a, like, real briefly just a basic setup of this like, so we can visualize what we're talking about? Okay. Um, let's take, for physics class, we make contrived problems. There, there's, the most practical of all problems is just the, the electric generator. But that's so, so boring. So we make contrived problems like saying, <laughs> like saying that we have a loop and the radius of this loop is changing such that r is equal to, let's say, r ought e to the minus bt. So it's getting smaller and smaller, and when time reaches infinity, it will have a radius of zero. And we have a magnetic field here. that's coming out. And I'll use a constant magnitude B. We usually don't mix it up and have two things that are time dependent. And I ask you, what is the EMF as a function of time? And we're just going to look at, yeah, well, we, we can determine everything. So what's the EMF? <sighs> what do we do? What do you think? We're assuming there's a voltage, there's a, a current going through this. Nope. The current's going to be created because we're making it smaller. She knows we should find what? I assume we should define VA at some point. Or A. Okay. Let's define A. A is equal to pi r squared, which is equal to pi r zero squared e to the minus 2 bt. Right, you square e to the minus bt, it's e to the minus 2bt. So there's my area. So my flux, I don't need to do any stinking calculus. My flux is just going to be the magnetic field times the area at some instant in time. So it's going to be ba. Notice the directions here. My magnetic field is normal to the loop, hence it's the same direction as a. And so that's why I just put ba. And so that's going to be b pi r0 squared e to the minus 2 bt. Step Is 2. The integral b a there? Well, the flux is integral of b dot d a. So if the magnetic field was changing over my area, I would need to integrate. But since the magnetic field is constant over the area, Oh, so we're just assuming, so the magnetic field... It's just a constant have, B. It's just a constant. Yeah. I, so it doesn't matter that your area is changing. Right. It doesn't matter that my area is changing for this integral because this is just B dot DA. So if the B is changing at this area compared to this area, then I need to do the integral. But if B is constant over the entire area, then I can bring the B outside and it's just integral of DA, which by definition is A. Right, because B is constant. Right, 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 right. That makes sense. I can do that. 
but the integral of dA is just the A vector. And then I had my directions because of the direction of my magnetic field here and the direction of my loop. That was just BA times cosine of zero, which is one. Why wouldn't it be, and I feel like this is overcomplicating this, but why wouldn't it be the integral of dA be the integral of pi r naught squared e to the negative 2bt dr naught? Well, it, it is, because that's what a is. Right here is a right here. Okay, so now that I have the magnetic flux, my EMF is equal to minus N. Well, my N is just going to be 1. Derivative of my magnetic flux with respect to time B pi R0 squared e to the minus 2BT. Well, only one part of that depends on time. And so you take that derivative, you just bring down the derivative of the exponent, which is minus 2b. Times e to the minus 2bt. And so that's my emf. And as for the direction, the current will be, the current will be in the direction to maintain the flux. What's happening to the flux as time increases? Is it staying the same, getting bigger, or getting smaller? I am going to zoom out a bit so you can. OK. The flux is getting smaller with time because the area of that circle is getting smaller with time. And so if the flux is getting smaller, what does Lenz's law tell us about the current direction? It's going to resist the change, so it's going to resist the flux getting smaller. So what direction is the magnetic field that's induced going to point? It's going to be the same direction. Oh, wait, my arrow, my, I forgot I didn't do x's. You were right. I'm sorry. And was pointing the correct direction. I thought I had x's in here. I can't see it anymore because I shrunk it down. And so I, I shook my head no because I think the magnetic field was going down. But it's going up. So it's going to be the same direction as it's going to be coming up. So the right hand says that it's going to have a current that's flowing like this. So can you just drop out the um, Could we just have like absolute value of EMF? Yeah. All the way through and then at the end just put like in the direction? Yes, we could have. So the negative end, that's just the number of turns. So you're saying we got one loop. Yeah, one yeah the end is one because I just had one loop. Now, one last thing that a student asked me in email yesterday, how would I find the magnitude of the current? I would need to know the resistance of the loop first. And then I would just use Ohm's law. I is equal to the EMF divided by the resistance in the loop. If the resistance in the loop is zero, how much current do I have? Infinite, right. <laughs> well, it's impossible to have zero resistance, so I'm not going to have infinite current. But that you have to know what the resistance is to be able to go from the induced EMF to the current. And, of course, you have to have a loop because what the student actually asked me about was question two on chapter 23. And question two on chapter 23 has a single bar moving in a magnetic field. So the magnetic field's like this, the bar's like this, and it's moving that direction. So everything's perpendicular. And it asks, what's the current? We learned in circuits class that in order to have a current, we need to have a, a closed loop. Just a bar, no closed loop. Hence, what's the current? Zero, because no closed loop. It was a <laughs> trick question, kind of. Two, two quick questions. You said there's no such thing as a zero, zero resistance. Isn't there? Superconductors still have resistance. It's just like a billion times less than the resistance in a normal wire. Isn't there another state? Though? It seems like 
I've seen a lot of stuff when I've been looking up the superconductors that compare it to, a, I thought it was a zero resistance conductor. Or it, well, it is much closer to zero. So for practical purposes, it might as well be zero, but it still has some finite resistance. Right, you, you form the Cooper pairs between electrons, and the Cooper pairs move as one, as, as a boson. And because they're moving as bosons, you don't have to increase the energy to move around. Any other question I was going to ask? Is EMF different in any way, shape, or form than voltage? Why do we um, EMF is the term we use for the voltage that is produced by a battery or a generator. So, no, it is, it is not fundamentally different from voltage. All righty, enjoy your pizza.